Today, most people acknowledge that there are such problems as war, crime, waste, peak oil, poverty, scarcity, violence, starvation, debt, slavery, homelessness, the use of fossil fuels, psychological and physical health issues, environmental degradation, and so forth. However, what people tend to ignore, or simply not realize, is that all of these problems are either created or exacerbated by the prevailing monetary market system of economy and consequential social conditioning. To elaborate on some of the problems previously mentioned, it may or may not surprise you that there are over five times more vacant houses than homeless people in the United States. We currently produce enough food to feed 18 billion people, but 2 billion people are currently starving on a planet of 7 billion. There are financial incentives to maintain public dependency on exponentially depleting fossil fuels that damage the environment. War is a highly profitable business, and businesses must grow in a growth economy. And war is also incentivized by the monopolistic and competitive nature of the market system for power consolidation. Likewise, the field of sustainability, both cultural and environmental, is currently primarily addressed within the confines of a faithfully upheld economic framework that is fundamentally unsustainable. Society attempts to solve such problems in isolation through patchwork solutions, blindly assuming the legitimacy of the current socio-economic arrangement that is actually causing the problems to begin with. For example, society currently attempts to deter violence by incarcerating people for violent behaviour, despite whether or not they were in an environment that reinforced or required such behaviour for their survival. Our current societal approach to addressing aberrant behaviour doesn't address the question, what environmental factors are generating or reinforcing violent behaviour, and how can we eliminate them? According to James Gilligan, the single most significant factor that affects the rate of violence is the degree of equality versus the degree of inequality in that society. Why is no one looking at the root causes of social problems? Well, there's no money to be made. The prison industrial complex in the United States makes over $100 billion per year income. And according to Michael C. Rupert, you have to create problems to create profit. Today, society commonly refers to our current monetary market system of social organisation as the economy. However, rarely do we step back and ask, does this system actually economise? Or, in other words, does this system reinforce optimal methods of resource extraction, production, allocation and preservation to ensure minimal waste and maximum efficiency to enable optimal human and environmental well-being? This thesis aims to answer the question, how could architecture assist in enabling culturally and environmentally sustainable economic practices? The methodology of this investigation will involve an analysis of the immutable principles of our current economic system. The comparison of a potential alternative economic framework will then give a common direction to work towards. The investigation of relative potential remedial architectural interventions will then proceed. The first chapter of my thesis is entitled The Anti-Economy, which discusses the fundamental attributes of the monetary system and market economy. The dominant form of currency used today is fiat. Fiat currency only has an imaginary or intangible value relative to the amount of units existing within a specific currency's money supply. In other words, its value is based on nothing more than scarcity and the cumulative faith of the populace. Furthermore, all money is created out of debt, both when you take out a loan and when you pay interest on that loan, the bank is creating money that didn't previously exist. If all of the world's loans were paid back today, there would not be any money left in circulation, and there would also be a lot of money owed that can literally never be paid back because it doesn't exist. The monetary system is used in conjunction with a market economy. In a market economy, decisions are based upon independent human actions through the vehicle of monetary exchange, regulated by the pressures of supply and demand. Production and distribution is enabled by the buying and selling of labour and material provisions, with the motivations of a person or group as the defining attribute of unfolding. The market economy consists of the following fundamental attributes. It requires cyclical consumption. Cyclical consumption is required by the monetary market economy in order to maintain currency circulation and growth, regardless of social or environmental consequence. The rate of currency circulation and resulting consumption must be perpetually increased in order for the growth economy to remain operational. The faster the rate of consumption, the more so-called economic growth is assumed. 
It also requires intrinsic obsolescence. This means that products are manufactured explicitly to make a profit. Therefore, manufacturing techniques and materials are used according to their cost efficiency. Technical efficiency is drastically inhibited because of this, resulting in inferior products that have short lifespans that mostly end up in landfill, often sold to third world countries as second-hand goods. It also requires planned obsolescence. Planned obsolescence is a direct response by industry to meet the need for cyclical consumption, a marketing strategy first theorised publicly in 1932 by Bernard London in a document entitled Ending the Depression Through Planned Obsolescence. This means that companies often deliberately withhold technical efficiency or design and manufacture things with the intent for them to break or malfunction to ensure repeat purchases by people that they see explicitly as consumers. It also requires property. The ownership metaphysic is a core premise of the market system, allowing controlled restriction of resources, information, land and goods for the primary purpose of economic exploitation, again, regardless of environmental or social consequence. This creates a territorial approach to societal management and can result in drastic technical inefficiencies and social dysfunction. For example, cars remain unused most of their lifespan, but could potentially be equipped with automated driving systems to allow the car to be publicly used as much as possible, which could free up a lot of wasted car park space, reduce accidents, and reduce the need for car manufacturing. In other words, sharing is a highly unprofitable idea. It also requires competition. Market competition is based upon personal and corporate competition for either personal employment or market share, both with the ultimate aim of self-maximizing profit. Competition creates established institutions that care more about their own short-term survival benefits than long-term progress and sustainability. Our profit-based system sets up a reinforced defensive propensity to stop any changes if those changes find the prior establishment obsolete. For example, if free, abundant, clean, renewable energy was made available on a global scale, then ExxonMobil and other oil companies would lose most of their market share. It's in their best financial interests to keep us dependent on them for energy. The market economy also requires perpetual human labour. The market economy needs a high percentage of the population to be employed so that they have purchasing power for consumer products to allow for cyclical consumption. However, most of the jobs that people are working are completely useless from a technical, social and environmental perspective. Furthermore, productivity is inverse to human employment in most sectors. This means that the more machines replace human labour, the higher the productivity. The monetary market economy also requires scarcity to function. As you may know, scarcity is one of the main drivers of value. 1% of the population currently owns 39% of the world's wealth. This should come at no surprise considering the economic principle of supply and demand is somewhat synonymous with scarcity and dependency. The less of something there is, or the less something is made abundantly available to the public, the more it is worth relative to its necessity or dependency, which must also be perpetuated. This means that once a product reaches a certain level of abundance, it is no longer profitable to produce any more of that product. Even if people physically require such a product, but don't have the money or demand to pay for it, hence the current poverty and starvation of 2 billion people. Scarcity is also manifest from this system through its required technical inefficiencies, resource allocation inefficiencies, and the need for cyclical consumption. The monetary market economy can't function without it. In Chapter 2, The Global Petri Dish, I discuss how there are many social issues that are directly and indirectly affected by our economic conduct. Human health, behaviour, psychological development, values, and so on, are all directly or indirectly affected by our economic system and relevant culture to one degree or another, although the connection is not always so obvious, and hence such causes are often falsely attributed to genetics or metaphysical notions such as greed or evil. In Chapter 3, An Economy is More Valuable Than Money, I discuss and compare the aforementioned attributes of a monetary market economy to a hypothetical alternative economic system based on scientific inquiry, commonly referred to as a resource-based economy. In a resource-based economy, decisions are based directly upon scientific understandings as they relate to optimised habitat management and human health. 
Production and distribution is regulated by the most technically efficient and sustainable approaches known, not what can be afforded. Hence, a resource-based economy is based on access over property, equality over inequality, collaboration over competition, optimum design over obsolescence, mechanization over human labor, preservation over consumption, and ultimately, abundance over scarcity. In Chapter 4, Consumer Texture or Design Science, I discuss how does the current economy affect architecture, and how could architecture adopt the principles of a sustainable economic system. I will demonstrate how buildings are currently explicitly designed so that the designers and stakeholders can profit, and how public architecture is primarily designed for consumerism and perpetual human labour, and so forth. I speculate how the aforementioned principles of a resource-based economy could be applied to architecture and city design. Designing to allow communal access to common facilities such as equipment sharing centres, research centres, leisure facilities and so forth, and designed for residential mobility, kind of like hotels. Without the restrictions of the monetary market economy, people would no longer be confined to a mortgage property in close proximity to their job. The types of residential infrastructure will vary, and will account for many different individual and social needs to provide a level of social equality. Designers would share an overarching collaborative design process with common objectives being social and environmental sustainability based on what is technically possible, not what can be afforded. A good example of this is the Global Redesign Institute, an online design initiative that aims to demonstrate to the public what is technically possible. Integrated design solutions would be based on scientific understandings of materials relevant to their rejuvenation rates, desired usage and context for optimum design. For example, we could design buildings to be either highly durable or to be highly adaptable and dismantable depending on the context. Until the process of design can be potentially automated sufficiently, buildings would be designed by people to allow for automated construction techniques such as automated prefabrication, construction and disassembly of modular components. Designers should also allow for automated systems within the architecture for example, cybernated farm systems, automated warehouses, distribution centres, cleaning systems, postal systems, etc. Designers could also allocate for automated integrated transportation, such as the use of evacuated tube transport technologies that have no friction or wind resistance and hence require less energy. To preserve resources, architects could either utilise current waste as construction materials use modular building components that can be disassembled and reassembled automatically, and use durable materials specific to their suitability to building style, context and function. Buildings would be designed to provide the necessities of the user through design to create an abundance. For example, the earth ship housing model incorporates its own food production, water catchment, grey water for fertiliser, thermal mass so no air conditioning is required, solar panels, etc. These principles could be met through a variation of an integrated systems approach and a decentralised approach. Ultimately, this problem requires a multifaceted approach to allow for collaboration across all professions with sustainability and progress being the motive. While such a radical change is very possible, potentially people may emotionally identify with the current sociological conditioning and hence reject concepts that challenge those beliefs without further investigation which would ultimately result in further human and environmental suffering. The main challenge for me so far has been fitting this broad-scale architectural approach into the word count without leading to a narrow conclusion. There are almost too many relative architectural approaches to consider, so please help me with this challenge in your feedback. Thanks very much for watching.